radiation, I mean, sorry, radiology and imaging, Dr. Khan. Uh, without much ado, let's uh, get on uh, with the next talk by Dr. Aditya Gupta. Aditya, this is about brain tumors, new approaches and technology. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Mani. And uh, I think it's going to be a tough job to follow Dr. Singhal's presentation. I think he had a very nice, very um, hard-hitting message. Mm, I'm going to convey a, a bunch of thoughts on uh, brain tumors and if I can have the slides, yeah. Thank you. So, you know, the incidence of brain, uh, incidence of brain tumors in India is not actually very, very high in terms of uh, per thousand population. But if you talk about the population of India, I think we are dealing with a massive caseload. Uh, if you talk about the patient perception, clearly, I think all of you will perceive that when it comes to a topic like brain tumors, there is a lot of, uh, you know, for the patient or the family, it's almost like a death sentence. And what are the reasons why the patients or the families perceive it that way? First of all, the myth is that brain tumor is cancer, which is actually not true. And I'll show you a slide in which, if you look at this bunch, pituitary tumors in many of these are all benign tumors. So half of these tumors are actually benign. So first of all, for a patient who is diagnosed to have some kind of a mass on a CT or MRI, this situation is not very bleak. The 50% chance is that this might be something very benign. Now the three other factors which sort of color the patient perception is that the patient or the family thinks that there is a limited lifespan, that is again a myth. Properly treated benign brain tumors will have a normal survival, normal quality of life. Third myth, treatment or surgery will lead to coma and paralysis. Uh, I think in the 60s and 70s that percentage was of the order of 30, 40 percent, maybe 20, 30 percent. Uh, right now, I what I can say is that um, the mortality from an elective neurosurgery is far below one percent, and the chance of leading up to a, let's say a paralysis or a functional deficit after surgery is to the tune of maybe less than five percent, more or less. The last myth is that a cure is not possible. I think for a large number of brain tumors, I think there is, especially for the benign ones, the cure is certainly possible. For gliomas, uh, which are the intrinsic tumors which arise from within the brain tissue, the, the message which I want to convey is of being more radical. Uh, Dr. Singhal's message for breast tumors and the, the smaller ones was to be less radical and reconstruct. Here the message is the opposite. You have to be more radical. So brain tumors pre present to us in a variety of ways, commonest being headaches, uh, seizures, dysfunction of the particular part of the brain which the tumor is involving, and raised pressure when the tumor <laughs> becomes of a certain size that it cannot be compensated. Let's talk a bit about gliomas which are the intrinsic tumors which arise from within the brain. The problem has been that these are locally infiltrative tumors. They actually don't have a clear margin, which the benign tumors do. And they are anywhere from grade one to grade four. If you look at the top image, you know, in the same tumor, there is a part which takes up contrast on MRI and lights up, and there's another one which doesn't. So glioma is actually, in many of the cases, a heterogeneous disease in which one part can be low grade, one part can be high grade. And histologically, glioma cells are very, very infiltrated <coughs> cells, even in tissue cultures. Some of these astrocytomas arise, uh, glioblastomas arise de novo, which is what I've shown here. These are typically elderly patients with a very short history. And others first become low grade and then progress to a high grade glioblastoma. <coughs> now, as, as uh, doctors, as medical people, 
you know that once we come across a patient who has this problem, we can change none of these factors which are part of the nature of the tumor. <coughs> we cannot change anything in these factors to give us a good survival. So the only thing we can change is how aggressively and how radically we remove them. And this has been the change in treating gliomas in the past 10, 20 years. In 20 years ago, the usual approach was just take a biopsy, it's a malignant tumor and we'll give radiation therapy. So in, in today's day and age, certainly that kind of a protocol is not followed anywhere. And there are several studies, I've just mentioned one as way back as 2001, which has shown that even in malignant gliomas, the more radically you remove the tumor, the better is the survival. Now in 60s and 70s, this is what the operating room looked like. So I'm now heading to the technology part. There has been a sea change of the kind of technology available to us to enhance the outcomes which we can deliver to our patients. And from 60s and 70s operating room looking like this, we now have an operating room which looks like that. And what you have here is the operating table and an MRI which is integrated within the operating room itself. This is the actual photograph of our operating room. And you have these microscopes which have a variety of capabilities. Through one eyepiece you can have an endoscope view, through one you can have a microscope view. If you inject the MRI into the microscope, it can outline the tumor to you when you're looking at it through the microscope. The other very significant revolution has been the imaging revolution. And what I would like to say is for any patient who has a brain tumor, I think the MRI is the standard of care choice for imaging. Uh, it just shows up the entire detail of the tumor very beautifully. And more so in the skull base where if you try to see a CT scan, there'll be a lot of bony artifacts because the skull base bone is very dense. And at the next level, look at this kind of uh, fiber tracking which you can do. And you can actually see is the tumor anywhere along the motor pathway or the sensory pathway or whichever pathway you want to look at inside the brain. So what are the newer modalities which are today giving us an edge in the survival and the management of these kind of tumors? First is navigation. We, we all know there is something called navigation when you're driving an automobile. And it is something similar, which uh, basically what it means is you do an MRI in a certain way, and once you load the MRI in the navigation system, the external landmarks can be registered by the system and you can navigate where exactly the tumor is coming onto the surface. I'll talk about this a bit later. Second is the intraoperative MRI. So what is the need for intraoperative MRI? MRI is, is very useful in surgery, and here I'll show a small video of how the patient from surgery table can, during surgery, go for an MRI. And before you close up, you can make sure you have removed the tumor entirely. And this is one way to be assured that you have done the best possible for the patient. And this is what I was telling you about. This particular patient, this is a large glioma in the brain. This is when a particular neurosurgeon thought that he had removed it all. I think many people can notice there is still a significant bed remaining. There are several studies which show that in 30% of the cases, purely a visual assessment that tumor has been removed completely is inaccurate. So in other words, we will be wrong 30% of the times when we assume that we have taken out a tumor totally. So this was the last MRI. So some examples from my series, this is a young lady who presented with seizures, classic low-grade glioma in the frontal lobe, and after taking it all out, this is the scan after four years, which shows that it's stable, no need for radiation therapy. A child who came to me with uh, unsteadiness, these are all MRI images, notice this large tumor which seems to be stuck to the brain stem. And in this particular case, what I did is I approached it from here. And I think I've taken out maybe 95% of it and there's just a little bit maybe remaining here. And this is the three year post resection MRI. And this is a pilocytic astrocytoma, which is a benign tumor. 
and this child is expected to have a normal life expectancy. A patient with a large glioblastoma, which is a malignant tumor, and when we sort of removed what we thought was the tumor entirely, we saw there was some remaining hair, and we went ahead and removed it totally after the first intraop scan. You can see this is an intraoperative scan because you can see the skin is lying open, the bone is lying open. Another few examples of a deeply located tumor. With the use of navigation, you can remove even deep tumors totally. Another few examples of malignant gliomas, which 10 years ago, people would have just taken out a small piece and said, let's send the patient for radiation. This is after the radical removal of the entire tumor. Another is an example which is very similar to that. Now then, let me come to the next thing, which is intraoperative fluorescence. Now, glioblastomas have a block in a particular enzyme so that if you administer this compound called 5-amino levulinic acid to the patient, this particular protoporphyrin accumulates only in glioblastoma cells. What it means is if you image in the microscope in a special blue light, the tumor will stand out in a pink color. And this is another method to increase the radical uh, the radicality of your exit. And again, a short video for that. This is a tumor, preoperative planning. This is a tumor visible on the surface, red in the blue light. And this is as we are starting to take it out. We can switch to blue light in between. It shows us the tumor right there. This is a QSA which we use to take out the tumor. And at the end of it, we reached a point wherein there was no more fluorescence and we thought we had taken out the tumor completely. So fluorescence is well documented and you have several studies which have documented that there is a significant difference of the excision of such tumor between using fluorescence and not using fluorescence. Uh, let's talk a bit now about the benign tumors. So, for benign tumors, navigation is very helpful. The reason why I say that is, is that it allows us to make smaller openings. In the older days, the, the complete head used to be shaved before neurosurgery, and there used to be large excisions, disfiguring for the patient. For example, even this deeply located tumor, I would just make a very, very small opening and a very, very small incision. This is uh, something which I did just four days ago. Uh, this lady came to me with both the eyes losing vision. And you can see in the MRI, there is this craniopharyngioma which is stuck to both the optic nerves. And she had a more of a decline in the left eye. So I went in from the left side, and this is the post-operative MRI which shows that the tumor has been taken out. And the vision improved the day later. Another example of a bad looking but benign tumor. This is a meningioma, which is a benign tumor. You can see many major blood vessels of the brain are actually lying inside the tumor. So this kind of a tumor needs a very, very special attention and care not to damage the blood vessels. And this is a post-operative MRI, which shows that there is just a little tiny bit of tumor remaining stuck to one of the blood vessels and more than 95% of it has been removed. The last five or seven minutes I would, I would take on something called radiosurgery and which I have been interested in for the past 15